<laughs> it's time for a Nerd Files episode, and I have Jordan here, Mr. More Light Required, <laughs> who's going to handhold the camera. This is going to be some high-class cinematography because nothing like a military aircraft mechanic to um, do a good job Thanks. handling a piece of equipment. All right, Jordan, here you go. So we've had a number of questions about Fisher's new 61K model ski. Also some questions about tips play, and I am going to use my superpower of veering off topic and expounding at length on an adjacent topic to cover both in one video, and we're going to try to keep this short enough to get into one video. 61K, new model from Fisher, and the marketing on this one has been vague at best. Fisher's official Marketing says it has pressure relief at the front and back of ski or tip and tail of the ski to make it better in softer conditions. I've also seen some suggestions out there that it's an overall shorter wheelbase. Um, here's the deal. Here's what I know about this 61K. It didn't come from the racing department. It's a production ski. So Fisher has a, uh, a development department that does the production of World Cup only skis and they're always pushing the boundaries. They're trying crazy things and the race department buys skis from them for the World Cup athletes. The development department works directly with teams. They get feedback. They're, they're trying to advance the cause. They're putting new technology on the snow. It's getting proven in World Cup races. This is a research and development program being tested in the real world. Every ski company has some version of this and that's where Fisher's race skis come from at a very high level, a World Cup level. But Fisher also moves a lot of production skis through their race department, and the race department is pretty stringent on what those look like. And this uh, 61K model is not something that evolved out of development. There's no 61K ski in the development department, but it has been brought to the market, and it is basically a reflection of the fact that the 610 ski can be a lot of different things. We've been mentioning this for a long time, that we use the 610 Plus Ski for almost everything, and we pick the camber specific to the task. So let's take a look here. I have taken some measurements of a handful of different skis here, and if you come up here, Jordan, all right, I wrote, I was helpful, there's a code. 61K, 61K, 61Q, 61Q, 61Q. Now, do you know what the blue tape signifies? Why would you know, Jordan? Jordan doesn't know anything about skis. Back up so they can see me, because they need to be able to see the presentation. <laughs> I, I put these all on a little squishy device to put 80 kilos of standard load in the same place on the ski. And the back of the blue tape here, the lower part, is the contact point at the front of the bridge. And the top of the blue tape is the contact point in front of this pressure zone. So that's uh, the tip opens all the way back to here. So 61K, if we look at the bridge length, it's actually not that short. In terms of the wheelbase, it's not a really shorter wheelbase than the 610 skis. Um, in terms of the amount of tip opening, yeah, it on average opens back further than the other skis. Um, 610 can be a lot of things, as I have mentioned. Here's a 610 ski with a pretty short contact area and kind of standard bridge length. Here's a very long contact area and the bridge comes back a little further. Here's a little more intermediate with the bridge back a little further. But once again, the 61K, it's essentially a 610. In racing, they have made a bunch of different series of 610. And in production, the same thing occurs. Fisher is constantly making new series of skis. That's one of the strengths of the brand. When we're selecting skis from Fisher, we like to spread it out and look at different series that are produced at different times of the year because they build different characteristics into the skis. And this gives us so much latitude to put the pressure zones and the contact areas exactly where we want them. The other thing we're looking at here is the uh, amount of opening in the tip of the ski. And this becomes interesting as well because essentially what we're discussing is tips play. Do you see the numbers up there? Indeed. So there I simply, with, with 80 kilos between the skis, measured the opening, the amount that the tips open up at a certain point, which is right at the tape. So the 61K is a 610. It's a 610 where Fisher has purposely open the tips a little further. The, the idea, the concept here is that they have their cold model ski, which puts a lot of ski on the snow. They have their 610 plus, which should be kind of a universal ski. In fact, that's exactly how we use it. We use it for almost everything. 
and we pick it in different productions and characteristics for different conditions, for different skiers, different applications. It gives us a ton of latitude when we look at all the different options out there. The 6.1K should be a shortcut to get a ski with quite a lot of tip opening. And it's not really a different ski. It's not a different mold. The 610 is really characterized by the bridge shape, position of the high point, and the overall function of the design. And that has not changed for the 61K. Shorter contact area, more tip splay. That's pretty much the story. Similar things happening in the tail. Well, no, not exactly similar. We're not going to talk about the tail because it gets, gets a little more complicated. And this more or less gives us the ability to differentiate these models, just looking at the front of the ski. But we're always looking at the contact zones in a similar way in the tail of the ski as well. OK, so tip splay. Why? What's the big deal? Why do we want tip splay? Um, Fisher has promoted this as uh, a ski for softer conditions. Interestingly, when they first brought their 902 classic ski to market, they called it a soft track ski. And once again, the 902 is a ski that builds in tip and tail splay. The story that I heard from Fisher years ago was that they built the 902 in response to Finnish skiers taking their 812 skis into a sauna, clamping, clamping them open and reshaping the skis. I've done this uh, in the heat box. I've remolded tons of skis just trying to see what you can do with skis. It's kind of cool. You can actually change the shape by bringing the temperature up high enough to soften the glue, let the ski kind of reset, let the laminates all slide past each other into a new configuration, and then let them cool down. Um, you got some work to clean it up afterwards, and it always seems to lose just a little bit of life, so I don't think remolding is a great idea. But uh, it happened, and apparently the Finns were remolding their own skis. That's what I was told by one of the race guys whew, a very long time ago, 10 years or more, um, and that they built the 902 in response to that. 902 has quickly become a really, really popular ski. When it was introduced, it was introduced as a soft track ski. However, in, when was it? 2003, World Championships, 2003, was it that long ago? In Val de Fiem, when Chris Freeman was quite young, and was fourth place in the 15K and had an awesome relay leg in that series as well. Super hard pack, uh, Val de Fiam snow. Um, it's, it's a classic there where it kind of warms up during the day. It refreezes, recrystallizes, and it's really hard, aggressive snow. And Chris was out there on a 902 ski in hard tracks. In fact, what we see is that these short contact areas often do really well in hard conditions and in particular, often in hard cold conditions. Um, so why is this a soft snow ski? And we're saying that short contact areas do well in hard conditions. Well, this is when things get a little vague. There, there are no hard and fast rules and things have, it has so much to do with the material characteristic of the ski. When we start talking about tip splay, what we are doing is absolutely talking about focusing the contact and the pressure into a smaller area. That seems to be related to better high speed performance. Um, sometimes though, particularly in colder conditions, it can be hard to get the ski moving. Like the initial static friction can be a little higher because the local pressure is quite a lot higher. Spreading the load out on the whole ski is not always the best thing. Interestingly, in soft, conditions from many brands, we want to see that load spread more because we're also concerned about flotation. Uh, Fisher is offering a ski with a ton of tip splay and a localized pressure zone as a soft snow ski, and yet that high pressure is likely to sink in soft snow, and we need to be concerned with the ski staying up on plane. But here's, here's what happens with Fisher, and this I think is something that's easy to forget when you start trying to make rules about what type of pressure distribution is good in hard tracks versus soft tracks. Um, Fisher materials have a very long bending radius, natural bending radius. If we just stress the ski, um, the ski doesn't flop back very easily, which is to say that they're quite stiff in the small materials out here. And because of that, even with a short focus pressure distribution, the integrity of this material will always draw the ski up on plane. It'll, it'll rise in the snowpack. And one of the strengths of Fisher's is its ability to carry speed in softer snow. Um, let's set up an illustration. Um, okay, so we have, we have a Fisher ski, a Solomon ski, and a Matsu ski here. And we're gonna do a little experiment. We are going to set them up like this. We're gonna kind of put the, the balance points or mounting points in about the same equivalent position, 
Can you see this okay? We want to focus up here. Yeah. And I want that two by four. I'm going to get down here. Can you see me also? Yeah. Okay, so when I talk about the material characteristics of the skis, we're concerned with the ski's ability to, rot, to ride high in the snow in soft conditions. And we're concerned that skis that have too compact a pressure zone and too much tips blade built in won't have the ability to ride high in the snow. But we need to consider the material characteristics and the bending radius in the forebody when we look at this. So here we go. We're going to load these skis all at the same time. And we're just simulating soft conditions by taking away the support underneath this material. And we're just going to let the tips kind of ride up. Can you get close enough to kind of see the difference in the bending radius there? Jordan, you got to tell me if you're seeing it. I'm seeing it. Okay, can you see that the Fisher ski doesn't bend as much as the others? The material is a little less flexible. Yes. All right. There we go. Okay, so that, that demonstration was just intended to show that this uh, longer bending radius, stiffer material out front can have a positive impact in softer snow. If you have a ski with very soft material out front and tips blade built in, you have really no support from the material up front. And because, because the material bends up at such a steep angle, it tends to plow back at the inflection. Okay, If this ski is, has a short pressure zone already, then the transition gets pretty hard as you reach that pressure zone where it's not going to yield so much. The Fisher ski tends to sit up. On the other hand, if you have a Fisher ski with a tip down, or if you have a Fisher ski that has positive camber in the forebody, it's a dead reject because that same stiff material, if it's under tension, is going to really fight the snow. This is why Fisher's 115 ski, which has the high point way out front and can sometimes have a little bit of uh, positive camber through the running surface, tends to carry a ton of tension and really get specialized for compact man-made snow, does poorly in natural snow, because when you put this material under tension, it doesn't behave very nicely. It's got to be supple and at equilibrium, and this is why Fisher tends to build this, um, this tip splay into most of their skis at one level or another. Other skis from other companies with softer material, they have to be a little more artful about their tips play and it needs to be controlled in a, in a little different way and we need to work with the skis very differently as well. This is why understanding the materials is really important for understanding tips play. So one more time, why tips play? Well, we want to optimize those contact areas and the amount of pressure that each position of the ski is carrying spreading the load out on a, as long a surface as possible is really old school thinking. That's not so much a thing anymore. I remember being in college, my college coach, Terry Aldrich, super good guy, really good coach. He showed me a ski one time. It was a Rosinol ski that belonged to a teammate. And he said, this is a definition of a bad ski. And he, and he squeezed it together and the tips opened up. And at the time that was conventional wisdom. If the tips open at all, it was a reject. You wanted long, smooth contact on the snow. And that's just not the case particularly as we deal with modern grooming, uh, more compact contact areas is universal. It's just the amount, the degree, and the amount of shape built into the ski as it relates to the ski material that becomes important. Did that make sense to you? Sure did. So if it makes sense to Jordan, have you stood on a cross-country ski before? No. Okay. Okay. So... If Jordan understands this, so can you. Indeed.